you ask me how safe your pictures are, they are not at all safe. And anything that's on your mobile or on your computer, as long as it is connected to the internet, please understand that this is just, you know many people tell me I don't share it. I have pictures to share it with you. There's no such thing, you don't share it with you, but there are so many people who are anyway taking the pictures from you. Let me give you one example. Like you know when you install your mobile apps, doesn't it ask for uh, access to your gallery? So who's made the mobile app? It's just a developer. Like you know she has a team that develops apps. Now let's say she, she creates an app for you know book my show or for Mumta Hindu or anybody and they say you okay, we want to you know uh, have access to your images. So what what do you mean what do you mean when they say that they need access to the gallery? The entire gallery. So whatever photographs you're storing, somebody else can also see. It's just not the Google or the Facebook, it's also the owner of that particular app. So like you know, in a recent case also, a lot of medical data has been breached. A lot is not. So that also included pictures of many of their private parts which they had sent to, uh, to the doctors. You know many times like to a skin doctor you would want to send a particular picture or to a gyna especially. That those pictures also, you think that it stays only on your phone and in the Dynax phone. No, it has gone all across. So nothing is safe. So, you know, uh, unfortunately we are in the era where we have to be like scared at every step if you're using the internet. So basically when you download an app and the first thing that the phone asks you, the notification that should you... Permissions. Uh, permissions and you yes. press... Permission to my gallery. Why should it require permission to my contacts? And you know many people say no, if you don't give the permission, the app won't install. There's nothing like that. So what you can also do is install the app, give it the permissions, immediately disconnect it from internet, the Wi-Fi or the mobile internet. Go back to the settings and again remove all the permissions. The app is going to work. And if it still doesn't work, who's at loss? Not me people. Those guys. So I would rather than go to the, you know, to the internet, to the browser, and then book a ticket. Then give it, and then take a chance of giving him access to my entire gallery. So basically, with the digital outbreak, you know, who is not age specific? It's not gender specific. Yes, when it is targeted abuse, then there is a specific age or a gender or there. Otherwise, it's each and every user who's in a hurry, who's not applying common sense, who's not applying logic. It's whatever you will do in a physical world for your safety, for your privacy, is exactly what you do in a cyber world. But just because the medium is built in such a way that the speed is so much, you are always very impatient and in a hurry that if I don't do it now, then it's lost. So that's where we fall prey to. So it's irrespective of age and gender. Like I have a client who's as young as 11 and another one is as old as 82. And men, women, women. Clearly not particularly age. And how strict, like if you commit a cyber crime today, how strict are the punishments for it? Like what goes behind? So if you see, uh, if, if it's only as per the IP Act, then it's not such severe. But then what the police stations do, they combine it with the, uh, you know, with the other code also, uh, IBC code also, then it becomes very, very harsh. So, but of course they are all there. <laughs> Some of them are in. So you can try it once if you want to, just... Uh, so anything related to children which falls under Foxo, then that's the severe most and it's absolutely not the Bullying, when it comes to cyber bullying, uh, we are looking at minimum three years of imprisonment with the fine as well. So it's not that it's uh, not very strict, but yes, the process is there. And this is one area where you're punishing, but what happens to the victim, the damage is way far. It, it takes sometimes years for the victims to get over that phase of life. Uh, unfortunately, the wound is not visible, so nobody can believe that okay, you're going through some sort of uh, distress, some sort of emotional, uh, you know, incompatibility over. And the worst affected is your trustability, because then you are so, uh, you know, conscious about everything that you always feel somebody is talking, somebody is laughing at you, kind of stuff. So 
that's where it gets worse. So according to the two of you, how has the government or the cyber cell taken any particular measures to prevent it from happening? Like are they serious enough? I'm not from the government, I'm not a cop. Uh, but then I've worked with them, you know, in several cases. So they are, uh, one thing what I will appreciate about the government, especially the Maharashtra cyber, is they have put a lot of efforts. I mean, I don't know about any other state putting in so much efforts as per what Maharashtra cyber has done, especially related to phishing also. They came up with a website report phishing dot in. Uh, they, they took complete charge when there was a, you know, one of the biggest uh, cases related to children related or abusive material, which incorrectly is referred to as child pornography. So there they made a lot of arrests and everything. So they are also being very proactive in spe uh, spreading a lot of awareness. So they are working quite a lot. The issue is that the criminals are not even just like 10 steps, but they are 100 steps ahead of us. So, you know, uh, as somebody was uh, saying yesterday, it is like, you know what, they just need to try a thousand times and one time, if it strikes you, you're gone. You know, this was the superintendent of police, uh, Dr. Balsam Rajput was saying, I was listening to him yesterday. But we consumers, we <coughs> citizens, have to prevent from getting attacked all thousand times. So every, so every attack we have to, like, you know, take care. So what kind of stress does cyber it directly impacts your self-esteem, your self-worth, your the, I, I've had clients who suffer from clinical depression, addictions, obsessions, all of this and the worst it can go till someone really getting paranoid about this falling into the real world also. See the more time you are engaged into cyber world, the line gets very thin between real and and we've had cases where it started in the real world and gone on to virtual world or vice versa. So that's where it gets very, very harassing and very difficult uh, for people to just stay awake. So for example, if it's uh, an alcohol addiction, it's easy because I can completely abstinate you from that. But when it comes to internet, when it comes to social media and the exposure, it's not, internet is not only used for this purpose. It has become an integral part. You know, right from your alarms, to your entire calendar management, appointments, everything we do. Communication is largely on internet. So, complete abstinence is very difficult. And that's where it gets very, very serious to handle the stress that comes with it. So, do you think that a remedy for this would be a lot of schools and colleges actually having a cyber psychologist? Because a lot of school and colleges anyway have a lot of counsellors to deal with everyday activities that the students go through, personal problems, professional problems and educative problems as well. So one of this could be actually a cyber psychologist as well, like in the new uh, Yes, with, with now schools uh, going international and uh, you know, having access to internet for the means of education as early as class 4 and class 5, it's very, very important for them also to sensitize children and make them aware of the risk. So as we say, prevention is the best cure. Technology, children are very sad, but they can't foresee the dangers. And that's where people like us have to step in and uh, at least sensitize them. Because it's not just uh, a simple internet browsing, it's the kind of content that is being served to them. And like, internet is like a Pandora's box. You, your child may just be looking at a soccer video on YouTube, but you never know what next is showing up. So the only way we can prevent it is to make them aware this can happen and to prepare them. Yes. So I, I would, uh, you know, so cyber psychologists can come at a second stage. What we first need is like a cyber guardian in the school. So start. I mean, you know, it should, uh, because now you all are becoming, we all are digital uh, citizens now, you know. So it's very important that every child, if they are going in like, you know, whether it's grade 1, grade 2, they all have these iPads and they have that. So you start the cyber etiquette, you start the cyber training and, you know, help them. You know, we always say, let's surf the net. You know, you wouldn't leave your child. Uh, so you are not going to leave your child uh, if you had to take them to an ocean or on a beach, you're just not just going to say, okay, go, surf. 
gonna go in the ocean. You're going to like train them. You're going to be you're going to be with them. So the same thing when you are stepping into the cyber journey, it's extremely important that you are with them. Talk to them about the positives. That's great because you know without internet you cannot do. But at the same time, tell them about the dangers. Well, for me, uh, I think almost all of them because they're so challenging. Uh, but yeah, the ones that were uh, related to children have always been very memorable for me. Because, you know, they have been like, they, even, they don't even know that they're getting exploited. The young kids, you know, they're as old as like, some of them are like 5 years, some of them are like 10 years. So some of them are 12, 13 years. So these boys and girls don't even know that they are being exploited. They don't know also what, they ha what has happened to them. So when I investigated those cases and you know we got the victims, uh, I mean you know we uh, got the culprits also. Not me, I didn't catch the culprits, means you know I investigated help the cops and all that. So those are the ones specially related to uh, child sexual abuse material because you know I'm going to use this platform to just tell all of you that uh, Possession of, in, you know, you may be in a particular group where there could be an exchange of adult pornography or obscene images also. That's for your own, within a group it's absolutely legal, there is no problem about it. But if any of the content is related to children, it could be an obscene cartoon, it could be an obscene image, it could be an obscene video about a child, even possessing it and even if you're not informing anyone, I mean, you know, to the uh, LEAs. So, uh, yeah, uh, law enforcement agencies, which means you're not informing the cops and all. That itself is also criminal. And if you don't inform or if you don't warn those people who are sending it, this will continue on. And what is the effect of it? The effect is so that, you know, down the line there will be many more such people, the producers as we call it, the creators of those videos, they will like encourage or they might just like, you know, do certain things against the will of the children. In any case, the children are not a part of it, but they would want to force them to do certain things. And that is how the crime against the children increases. So, you know, just step on board and help over it. Every case is different and every victim uh, who goes through something is really, really, uh, very different and very sensitive to go through. But uh, one of uh, the cases that I, I cannot forget uh, was during my experience with MTV Patrol Police. So uh, the whole show, if some of you all have seen it, the show was about uh, celebrities get trolled and they wanted a platform where they could bring the trolls on face and ask them why are you doing this. So I was the therapist on the show and uh, Tapsi Pandit's story was a young guy and when I was talking to them about uh, 16 trolls I had met and I've come to the part of the show. So. Uh, out of 16, there was only one guy who intentionally did this. The rest all did it only for entertainment. Time pass was the word they told me. And this guy is just 23. And it was one night after his exam that he was getting bored is when he started writing uh, a little, uh, you know, uh, you could say it as not so happy comments to Tapsi. And then without he himself realizing that the way the whole dissemination effect happened on screen, he just went on to the ex extent of writing horrendous sexual comments, which was unbelievable because when I met him in person, he was just like someone from yours and mine family. So this is the kind of impact internet can have on us. We call it in our psychology term as dissemination effect, and this is of course a toxic one. Where because you are dealing with a screen, there is no other person. You are not looking at Tapsi when you are talking to her or when you are telling something to her. So you are going to go on and on and on without realizing. So I really cannot forget. So when I spoke to him and when we made him realize that this is what you've done, it was very difficult for him to go through it. It took a lot of time for us to counsel him to make him understand that so he was, the guilt took over very badly. So that's one case I really don't have to forget. Because I believe that if 50% are victims, the other 50% are the offenders and most of them are by, you know, they are the accidental offenders. They have not realized that when they have crossed that line. 
or when they have uh, you know taken that entertainment portion to another level so this is it's very important that we take a pause while we are writing while we are commenting while we are reacting we change that reaction to response on internet which is where our logical and analytical thinking can step in so that's one i always take that as an example to address it because it will it not happen to you so first we are living in a digital era and it's like already a big thing so if you want to make a career like how you both have made successful careers uh, a very technical question what is are the educational facilities to get where you both are what are the educa what education does one person need Of course, you need the passion. Yeah, you need the passion because uh, when Google can answer everything, when Alexa has come to a point that it can replace your wife also in arguments. So I think uh, you know, with all these, you have Udemy, you have so many courses. Course like Python becoming such simple, you can just go online and just learn. So what's there? It's just like all you need is a laptop with an internet connection, the passion, and you just start because the entire network, at least as far as cyber crime investigations are concerned, you need to know about cyber security. You need to know about the infrastructure, how technology works. Yeah, so you can like in one machine also you can have like eight machines. You know the virtual machines you can have as many as you want. You can set up your own lab. You can use a virtual lab. So you know, not really that you need to be. You can be from any line. You can be a arts fellow, science commerce, even an uneducated, even tenth pass, um, and and you can reach wherever you want. It's it's not that difficult as such. You just need to be hands on all the time. And in terms of uh, cyber security, so there are some India we do not see any uh, university or any college that is offering this. Degree, uh, but from my personal experience, I can say that I have a 20 year um, long standing IT career, which has helped. So it's it's kind of a perfect marriage of IT and psychology. Is what uh, can make you more successful than any degree that you would want to go and learn. Because what what you need over here is more of understanding of human behavior and the technology, how it works. Because that's when you can relate that yes, this is. Why this can be? How this is how this can be taken care of, and this is how this is impacting us. Thank you so much. That means we done is at least change all the auto syncs because we've had cases where auto sync is on, and then the pictures that you don't want are synced with uh, uh, Google Play or uh, iCloud, or even there are even if you are on social media, by default the sync is always on. Whether it is Instagram, whether it is Facebook, so it's very important to have one. And the second thing is this whole idea of tagging. Let's respect each other's privacy. So uh, we all have that access that yes, I can go and put a tag that nobody can. Even if the tag, it won't directly be published until I get that permission. But also before tagging, we, we inform. Like if we do that as a practice wherever we do that, look, I'm going to use this picture and put it on the internet. And I would tag if you do not. So let's start in getting into that practice. Uh, yes, I think it's just as a hack. As a hack. Uh, anyone from? Absolutely, because uh, see, let's understand why did they give a feature? They gave the feature so that they would want to know something about you. So they already have a photograph about you. Okay, and that photograph says a lot. So let's say when I look at you, you look Indian. You're fair. This is your height. This is your build. I already have. But it would be great if I also come to know where you took the picture. So which means, so this is, so this data. I mean, why are the world's biggest guys entering into the cyber space, and why are they so successful? They are only so successful because they have so much of information about you. They have a lot of information about you, and. And so it is. And who's giving this information? They are not stealing, but we are giving. So when you are geotagging, you know, even when your, you know, your locations are always kept on. So they are actually making. And it's not a human sitting over there. It's an AI machine, the artificial intelligence machine, which is doing that. Okay, okay, this guy, let's say Rohan, you know, he gets up at this particular point of time, 
okay, he takes his bath at this point of time and gets ready, he goes here, he looks like this and whenever you have taken a photograph, at what location you have, so these locations help them a lot. So a lot of this needs to be as much as possible avoided because does that help you? Firstly, when you take a photograph, you know, does that help you that they, you know where you took the picture? So why do we want to give this information? And see, have you seen the number of emails or SMS you used to receive, let's say, five years back? And now, it was this, now it's this. Why? It's not because you signed up for them. It's because they have so much of information about you. So, so look at, so it is like another form of, you know, a very mind harassment. Just imagine if you have taken a picture and you are at, uh, let's say somewhere at Mathera. Suddenly all those offers start coming up. That is one, try, you must have seen that. You try, like, you, know, you want to check out Singapore. And everywhere on Facebook, Instagram, on your emails and SMSs, you start getting offers. So these are the drawbacks, you know that. Yeah. Uh, I'll just add one to this that uh, the question is not is it bad or not, is it bad for me or not, it's up to you how much of your privacy you want to make it public. If you're okay about your life being a little public, you can go ahead as well. So technology itself is not 